Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks for the organizers. It's a really great conference so far. Um, I also don't want to keep all of you too long from the next coffee break because the coffee here is awesome. So let's get right into this. As databases are used to store pretty much every information we have these days, it's kind of a thing that Django has to support that as well. And well, Django does support databases out of the box, a bunch of them. And of course, given this, giving a talk on databases here or database-related things, I can, could talk like all day about that or fill an entire conference with one talk talking about da databases. Um, but this, this doesn't, that's too much for, for me, just for me to talk about. So let's give me, let, let me give you a bit of background information to then come back on this talk, uh, topic of this talk, which are indexes. And when you want to talk about databases, you need to know about one of the backgrounds in databases. And that's relational algebra. So when you look at these slides, neither you nor I have any idea what that says, so let's go on. Um, let's take a look at how database lookups work, because that's what pretty much everybody does these days. And let's have a look at this database table. It's fairly easy, fairly, fairly simple. We have a seven rows with an ID, which is the primary key. We have a name of a person and then an age, let's say, when they first started programming. And now let's assume we want to pick the person or the people in this database that started coding at age 19. We can do this with the select query you see at the top here, which is select star from people where age equals 19. That's fairly straightforward for those people who are familiar with SQL, and the query in, in Django for that doesn't look too different. Now, how can you find each per person matching that query? And you might come, go and say, well, we just look at every row in this table and see if, this, if the age is 19. Well, this is actually how databases work, and that's what databases do. You look through the row, does H, is, is H19? No, it's not, so I discard this row in the output and go on to the next table. This is called a full table scan. This scales for like seven rows, which we have here. But now imagine you have like 100,000, 100 million, 100 billion, or even more rows in your database table. This could get pretty long running if you want need to look at every single query, every single row, and not just have this fairly easy and fairly trivial check on the or condition to filter on rows. So we want something that is much better, that gives some timing guarantees unrelated to the amount of data we have in our database. And what comes into, what joins the party in this, in this part are database indexes. Now, let me talk, about, about index, uh, talk a bit about indexes. Well, as briefly mentioned, they give uh, access to a single row or multiple rows in your ta database table, and also they have a guarantee on, t or some certain guarantee on timing, which then also means certain lookups are fast, unrelated if you have 100 or 200 million rows, for example. And when you use the, um, indexes, the access, unlike a full table scan, is called random access. You will see why that is in a bit later this talk. But first, look at how the most common index type that databases support these days actually works. And this, data, this index type is called B-tree or B-plus tree. It's named either after the, one of the inventors, Rudolf Bayer, or because they are self-balancing. That is not really clear. Nobody, neither, well, neither the author decided what or why they are called that name, nor every, anybody like said, okay, we're gonna call them B-trees because of. Self-balancing means that 
unrelated to the amount of data, you pretty much have guarantees on the timing, which is a crucial requirement for indexes. And going on a bit further, you will see how, why this works that well, that way, especially or as essentially for B trees. Let's look at how B trees work, because that's essentially what this part of what this talk is about. As with every tree we have on well, in the world, both in computer science as in ni nature, a tree has a root. The difference between the trees in the nature and in computer science, and we computer scientists seem to put the root at the top, which for whatever reason doesn't make any, things to, any sense to me, but well, there we go. Anyway, so we have this root node, or this node thingy in a graph, in a, in a tree, sorry. This tree is of grade three, which means we have three boxes at the top, which, is, which are placeholders for keys or for values. In the example we had before, this is where you put an H, for example. Then we have these four boxes underneath, which refer to, or which are holders for pointers, which go to point to another leaf or another node in the tree, or which point to a single row in your database table. And how you populate those values up here, you will see on this slide. Let's pick two of the values we had from the, we had in the table before, for example, 11 and 37. Well, we just, we only have like these, these two keys, so we only have two values up there. The, we leave the third one empty. That's fine. Then the rows underneath we populate with pointers. And because we have our database table has more than like two or three values, well, we need some more space in our tree, which means we have a whole another layer of nodes. And when you start counting those boxes, you, those for the keys, you see you have space for nine keys, which is sufficient for our table, which, ha which had seven keys or seven rows. Then also the pointers you put here are, have some, some follow some um, rules where they point. So if you have keys that are below 11, you put them in this node. If you have keys that are greater or equal 11 or smaller 37, they go in this node or corresponding greater or equal 37 go in the right node. Which means that unrelated to where you go, you always have just one error you need to, need to follow. Putting in the ages from the table we had before, this can look a bit like this. We have number three and five on the, in the left node, 11, 13 in the middle, 11, 13 and 19 in the middle, and then 37 and 41 on the right. That's pretty much evenly um, distributed. Now, coming back to random access, this is kind of where the magic starts to happen. These pointers we have at the bottom here allow, you, allow us to point to a, single, to a particular row in the database table. And, well, we have this po key point to the row which H3, H5, and so on. This is fairly straightforward. But B-trees have another property, which I'm gonna talk about in a bit as well. They have these pointers from one of those nodes in the, bo in the bottom line to the next node and to the next node, which then allows for something called index scan, which I'll expl explain as well. But coming back to those pointers from the leaf nodes, you can now see on this slide why it's called random access. When you look at numbers for the H3, well, you go for this row. If you go for number five, you're somewhere down here. So the database kind of randomly puts those pointers to, to random rows, essentially. So it's not just, I'm gonna read the table in chronological order, I read it in whatever the order the index gives me, which is essentially random and that's or thus it's called random access. Let's look at the query we had in the beginning. 
select staff from people where age equals 19. And let's look at how this lookup works using an index. Well, we look for 19, which is obviously bigger than 11 and smaller than 37, at least last time I checked. So we go to this node. And well, there we have this 19. And thus we can go and use this pointer and then find this row with age 19. You see how we have like one, two steps to find a particular row that has this 19 in there? Remember we had like seven rows we had to look at before when we did a sequential table scan or full table scan. Well, and we also know because this one here, or there's no other 19 in this tree, there's no other row with a 19. So we, are, we can just stop after we found this one row. It's already, you can already see the benefit in the small example, but now think about like the 100 trillion rows and how quick an access could, access could be. Now let's look at a query which is slightly different. So select count from people where, where the age is in some range. This is where the index scan is being used. Because when you think about that, what do we actually need for, or what do we actually want with this query? We want the amount of people that have a certain, in our table with, within a certain age when they first started coding. What do we need for that? Well, we only need the occurrence of this age in the index, which means having this B-tree, well, we look up the five, which goes here. We look up all the next keys, which fit this property, which means one, two, three, these three values of all we need, and that's about it. We don't even need to access the database table. We don't follow any of those pointers to the database table, which means, means that this access or this query is even faster than the query we had before. So as you can see, indexes are awesome. So let's have them in Django. And well, actually, we already do, so, at least somewhat, to some degree. There's db index equals true, which you can set on a field. And this essentially puts this type of index, a b-tree, onto this field in your database. And you don't need to worry about anything else. There's DB index, or there's index together, index together, which means you can define an index of on multiple columns. There are obviously foreign keys of all sorts, which underneath also use a B tree because only that this way it makes or it's fairly easy to follow the constraints. And then there's obviously primary key, which Django automatically populates as your ID column unless you set this on a different field. So this is great. But the feature set is somewhat limiting because there's not just B trees out there in databases. There's a whole bunch more. Let's look at 2016. Um, Mark Tumlin and I had some ideas for our indexes. Actually, Mark had some more already doing his contract process work. And we had thoughts on APIs and things we would like to have in Django. Like, let's make Django support all the indexes that are out there, maybe, possibly, who knows? So the problem was we didn't really have time because, well, we have day jobs and we have things we, well, we need to earn a living as well. But we got lucky. Well, actually, the Django project got lucky. Because there's a thing called Google Summer of Code that Django was accepted for in 2016 again. For you who don't know what Google Summer of Code is, it's a three-month in, three internship for students that, where Google pays them for three months while, being, while they are being mentored by contributors from that organization or projects, yeah, by projects com um, contributors. So in 2016, for the most part, Tim Graham, but also Mark and I mentored 
a student, Akshay, or his nickname is Aki, from India, who was tackling this generic index support in Django. And this went from writing the initial proposal down to here we have a bunch of patches merged into Django. And the major outcome of this, um, of this internship or Google Summer of Code project is a class called index, which takes a, field, a, a list of fields and a name. And this is going to be in Django 1.11, which is, I guess, supposed to be released later today. I'm not entirely sure, I think so. Um, it defines pretty much the base class of all the indexes we want to have in Django. And you can use them, you can use this index class via a new thing on the underscore meta or in the class meta on a model called indexes. And well, let's look at a look how that looks. Well, for example, this. You can define a B tree because index refers to B tree because that's the default one all databases seem to support. Um, we, this will define a B tree or B plus tree on an uh, index column called name, which is obviously referring to this field you have there. And well, that's it. Now you, s you might think this is already something that Django has. And you're right, this is something you can do with db index equals true. So, okay, that's nothing new. But you can also define an index on multiple, field, multiple columns. That's awesome. Granted, this is already possible in Django before, because this is what index together does. So why do we have that? Well, it turns out there are other index classes that are not B3. For example, gin index. A gin index you, you want to use on a JSONB field. So if you have a blob of JSON you want to put in your database, that's fine. That's like the NoSQL thing you do. Um, you probably or you might want to index on some key value things in this JSON. This is where you want to have a gin index. And now you can say, I want to have a gin index on this data field, which is a JSON field. And all the magic just happens underneath. You could do that before to some degree. It wasn't really, wasn't really pleasant. It worked, though. Another built-in index type that ship with, ships with Django 1.11 is the Brin index, which, um, which you can supply for, well, which can supply much faster querying time on aggregations, so, such as finding the last time each artic article was purchased. Let's look at this, the SQL Django creates, because obviously indexes are schema related, so it's obviously tracked during the, or through the migration framework. And well, there you go, create index something using gin. So this is the Postgres um, complement to what happens there. There's another, um, so yeah, this is how uh, Django would create an index through migrations. Now, Django 1.11 is the first start where we introduce this new API. We have some support for other things, but there's certainly a lot more area to explore now and to work on. And so let's have a look at what we could do with Django 2.0. For example, functional indexes. So you might want to query on the name of a person, but you don't really want to query on the raw value, so uppercase, lower la la lowercase. You actually want to query on the just the lowercase. We could do that with a functional index and then use this expression API, which turns out way more flexible than anybody ha might have thought in the beginning, and define the lowercase on the name and have this as an index on our database table. And now you could do a query which uses lower, and this was just use the index for that. Magic happens. Then there's DB index, of course we have that, but how about we may support, give it support for an index class? This may make sense if you want to have a hash index on the name. I'm not sure if it, that, that particular example makes sense, but it may make sense to not just support true and false there. 
Then looking at looking back at the, gen um, the, the JSON field we had before, why do we want to have this setting of DB index equals true, or why do we need to have the gin index defined in the indexes thingy in your meta class? Couldn't we just define a default index type for a field and then use DB index equals true to use that? Might be convenient. And then coming up with all the, with this entire new API, there's a thing we have now like three places where you can define indexes. That works. It's from a software development or software engineering perspective not necessarily best idea. So let's think about refactoring some of those things and just use indexes because that's our new shiny API which should do, do all the things. So this is something that certainly is an area to explore. And there's a thing called gist index in Postgres, which can be used for, geos for example, for geospatial information. So it gives me all the points in my database that are within a proximity of something of, this, of a given point. For whatever reason, this didn't make it in 1.11. I have no idea why. Probably because nobody contributed something. So speaking of contributing, there's prints. And I hope all of you are attending. They are on, I believe, Thursday, Friday. And speak to me, speak to any other contributor, any other in the person in the room, effectively, and talk about those ideas, come up with other ideas, and then create tickets if there are none, and start getting discussion rolling on those features. Because this is something, this is the, essentially the time when you want to start contributing to Django 2.0. Speaking of Django 2.0, this is the first release where Django will not support Python 2. Please remember that. <laughs> you should look at the commit history when Tim branched off the 1.11 release and follow the, the master branch there. Remove Python 2 support for X, remove Python 2 support for Y. This is really good, really nice looking at. All right, thank you. I'm Markus Holtermann. I'm a Django core developer working at LaterPay in Munich. We do micropayment for, well, content, online content providers. And if you want to work with us or for us, we are hiring. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. So please come to the front. Hi. Hi. Um, with uh, the new indexes, what is the easiest way to say for, say, a string field, I want to be able to have an index that supports equality, but not all the fancy, uh, you know, partial matching which you get by default if you say DB index equals true? I guess you want to, or probably would do that via functional indexes. I'm not entirely sure on the, on the database. So you would want to, you would want to match, make your index, you would want to have, want to create an index which, given a string, in this case, or given a value, do something with, this, with the existing value and, and match that. And then, essentially, I, I, I guess it's going to happen through the expressions API. So just to be clear, is that, already, that functionality already in 111? No, no, I'm working on that. I'm not entirely there. Uh, this is where I am. I have this evil nun going on here. and. If somebody has knowledge of the expression API, talk to me. I want to fix this. Um, so yeah, I think we are almost there, but not quite yet. But it's looking good for 2.0. Hi, great talk. Thank um, you. Is there a way to easily find out um, where I should put an index? Um, or do I have to use uh, Postgres? Uh, um, you should use Postgres, probably. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, some Postgres uh, analysis tools. For so there's, uh, yeah. So the idea of um, why I gave this talk or called this talk to, to index or not is not the question. Is there's if you want to or what what you want to index highly depends on your particular use case of it of your project. You can have if you 
write heavy, you probably won't have less indexes. If it's read heavy, it's, you probably want to have more indexes. To figure out which of those indexes or where you want to have an index, you pretty much put an explain as like explain space in front of your query and run it against the da your database. This is, I believe, part of the SQL standard, so it should work on all the databases you have. And it will give you a, um, a well, call tree or a query execution plan that the database is going to use, um, which says, OK, I have this, probably going to have these many rows here that are using this index, or no, I'm not going to use an index here because I don't have one, uh, so I'm going to use a full table scan. And it's a bit hard to, f to understand in the beginning, but um, looking at it a couple of times and reading some docs along that, um, essentially explain query is, um, at least in Postgres, the way I would go and figure out how I optimize my query. Great. Thanks. Sure. Speaking of, of course we should all be using Postgres, but many of us aren't. Uh, what's the status of these cross, uh, uh, the, the cross database support of this? Because MySQL's indexes are completely different. Um, yes and no. MySQL doesn't have this bring, gist, gin, what not features. It still do has beach clusters. And essentially, that goes for the same applies to SQLite and I believe, highly believe Oracle. Felix, where are you? Does it have support for B plus trees? Probably, I don't know. Anyway, um, so yeah, the, the default index, the Django DB models, no, Django DB models dot index is the index class, which I mentioned uh, here. This one has, is essentially a representation of the default index type. Um, any other th class that inherits from that pretty much puts this using in this database query. It refers to the default index type on their database. And because Django is cross database, it's essentially cr doing cross database support for that. Sure, okay, so it's a bit like the Postgres backend and that there's, there is features that the index is there for everything, but you can, if, if your database happens to have a whatever. Magic index then, then which does all the things, yes. Yeah. You can come up with magic index class, which does the magic. Hello. Hi. Uh, thanks for this talk. I uh, think this using clause um, here um, made me um, realize that usually when you have indexes in the database, the database figures out which indexes to use in a specific query. But um, sometimes you can give it hints and say, for this query, it's better to use this index. Mm -hmm. Is there, are there any thoughts of uh, adding that to the ORM? I guess it's uh, something we can add to, yeah, this list here. Um, there's no support for that. There's, well, not, I haven't planned any, su any support for that because I have no ha idea of how that works. But I guess there's, we could come up with an API to do that. So if you are interested on that, I guess speak to Shai and open a ticket, get the discussion, start, discussion starting, starting and yeah. Any more question? Okay. Uh, there are no more. I, I think we can have coffee a bit earlier. Coffee break. Yay. Enjoy a bit of refreshment. Thank you, Marcus. And thanks. You'll be